Okay, it's Wednesday. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech. Why should you be surprised? Okay, and uh, we have Community Matters right now with Gigi Davidson, and uh, she is the center person um, of uh, Ohana Computer, computer with a K. Hi, Gigi. Aloha. How are you today? Good. I'm, I'm just as good as I was, you know, years ago when you and I had a, a, a show before. And uh, you reminded me there's two shows we had before. <laughs> You know, you're a special person in the think tech family. Thank you. Uh, so I, you know, Ohana computer is is for years and years. It's been it's been finding, sometimes uh, rehabilitating, and distributing computers uh, to disadvantaged communities in Hawaii. This is a real mitzvah, and um, you know, up to this point, we've been very happy that you've done that. And did I misstate anything there? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, we haven't really, we've found a nominal amount of computers and distributed them. That's not our primary focus. Our primary focus is teaching computer application skills within the community, which often lacks computers, so we try and help them look for them. Hmm. What kind of skills? Uh, basic computer application skills, word processing, desktop publishing, spreadsheets, multimedia, database. Um, what we find is that um, most children today, they're very good at texting and playing games and manipulating the internet, but that's very different than using the computer appropriately to do their schoolwork. Mm, yeah. So uh, what, what, makes, uh, what makes you qualified to do this? Well, we've been doing this for 20 years. So we've developed a curriculum that's been updated several times and uh, primarily focusing on Microsoft Office. And before this COVID pandemic started, we already had the idea that the next phase for us would be to create an online version of our curriculum. And we wrote a grant and we got funded in April after the pandemic hit. So it became uh, much more relevant. So that's yeah. what we're working on full tilt boogie right now. That's a, that's a term we use here at ThinkTech very often, full tilt boogie. I, <laughs> we must be related or something. Uh, anyway, Gigi, so um, COVID has changed things, you know, I mean, and, and, and indeed, you know, one of the things that strikes me, I mean, you're dealing with the underprivileged communities, the disadvantaged, uh, low-income communities, and, and so you've probably seen the, the digital divide, you know, in fact, the digital divide sounds like it's right in, in, in the middle of Ohana Computer, that's what it's about. Right. Um, and now COVID comes along, and COVID, see if you agree with me on this, COVID accentuates, it aggravates, exacerbates the digital divide. Um, because, you know, because in the digital, in, in COVID time, we are more dependent than we were before. We, meaning all of us, are more dependent on computers. And so, um, you know, if I have a computer, I'm happy to have a computer, uh, then I'm, 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 I'm able to spend my time productively and so forth. Um, but if I don't have a computer, I'm, I'm, I'm not able to do that. And I, I lose ground. And, and that's part of, this is part of going back to school. It's going back, you know, it's, it's part of the going back to school issue that, that people are talking about all over the country about whether a parent wants a child to go back or not go back. And, you know, they, and I think this is a euphemistic thing about it. They say, um, you know, I, I want my kid to go back to school, but, but built into that, embedded into that is the kid at school has a computer. At home, he may not have a computer, or he may not have the people like you who will teach him how to use the computer and therefore narrow the digital divide. So what are your thoughts about that whole issue? How right am I? How wrong am I? Well, I think you're, uh, you're pretty right. I think um, the, the head of the DOE said that 75% um, have computers. So computers are a problem, and so is connectivity a problem. Um, actually, it's throwing the educational system into a tailspin because in March they were just thrust into having to go online and they were ill prepared to do it at that time. And um, they still actually have a long way to go. Um, they're focusing on trying to get computers to families that don't have them and connectivity. And I think the community is, is helping with that. But I had a thought today that, okay, the community can help with that, but we probably need to do some parent training on, okay, how do you monitor your child? How do you build in safety? 
How do they log in? How do you pay attention to what they're doing? How do you keep them productive? Likewise, so, um, you know, I feel like we're, we're working with a couple of schools and um, it's still evolving. It's, it's really hard to make significant progress because they're all worried about what are they gonna do? How are they gonna do it? They need computers, they know that, but has it been well thought out and planned out and have they had appropriate time to do so? I don't think so. Um, and you can't just ban put the Band-Aid approach, but that's what's gonna happen for right now. Yeah, okay, but what's, what's the goal? What's the vision? How do you see this unfolding in the optimal way, Gigi? Well, I think that the world is going towards more distance learning. Who knows how long this pandemic is gonna be around? Um, and I think we have to be prepared to, to, for it. Personally, if I had a young child, I, I don't think I'd want them to be in school right now. I don't feel like it's really safe. And then they bring it home and then it gets spreads to the family. I don't know, but I guess every parent has a different take. And of course, parents have to go to work. So there's there's lots of problems that come into play that have never nobody's ever had to address before. So um, it's a big sy systemic problem, I think, you know, but I, I do feel like people need to be prepared to go towards more distant learning. And that's the way of the future anyway. So we shouldn't be fighting it. I, I'm not saying that we shouldn't be in the classroom. That's the ideal situation but as an alternative, and maybe there's a mix of both um, that, can, that can occur. Well, you know, Zoom, is, Zoom has arrived. We are in the Zoom world now. And what, one of the things that, I, that sticks with me to, to respond to your point one, is uh, that there's a lot of colleges in the country that are shutting down. And, and, the, and education, higher education is changing. Uh, there, you know, for as long as COVID lasts, they really don't want those kids there. Uh, and I know that they need the money, they need the tuition, and they're losing the, uh, the Chinese students because you know Chinese students are leaving already, a huge source of revenue. Um, so education, colleges are in trouble. Education isn't hasn't traditionally been quick to change, which is kind of contrary to what it should be. So yeah. it's it's really kind of forcing the issue. Um, but I think there's kind of a lot of band-aid approaches. I think it needs to be well thought out and well planned and it takes time to do that correctly. But um, in the meantime, in the meantime, things will move to online learning and it'll get better. Like when our curriculum's done, it's gonna be very interactive and it's gonna be so the teacher can lead it online um, with the kids and or, as, or, or maybe um, used as a standalone unit in case of need. Um, but what's very important for kids is, you know, they're, they're very impulsive. They, their attention span is a nanosecond. So it has to be very interactive or they're not going to do it. You know, they're just going to skip it. <laughs> and yeah. someone has to monitor them. There's always going to be a need for a classroom teacher, whether it's through Zoom or in the classroom, um, because otherwise you're just giving them a free reign to, to goof around. <laughs> well, let, let's talk about this other thing that came out in the paper or maybe I saw it on television, um, the two blend, it seems like to me these days. Um, the, it was um, a, a, an entrepreneur, a very innovative entrepreneur, who sends around um, teachers to teach in small groups. And so the teacher comes to your house, sort of like the, uh, the violin teacher, you know, or the piano teacher <laughs> comes to your house. And maybe you have a bunch of kids in the same family, <clears throat> Maybe you have a bunch of kids from the immediate vicinity and they chip in and pay this person. And this person teaches them at home. Um, and that's, that's uh, better, I suppose, in terms of COVID than, and you remember that photograph of all those hundreds of kids in a, yeah. in a hallway? In some a hallway, yeah. yeah. That was just perfect to make the point. Uh, but this would, you know, this would have a, this would have masks. Uh, this would have a little distance, um, and this would have somebody to watch those kids so they don't go off the side. Well, what do you my, think? What do you think of that idea? Is that has that got traction? I think it, it. I think it's definitely viable. I have a teacher who's getting lots of requests from her friends that have children, and she said her advice is, you know, you got to sit down, you got to make a plan, you got to do this, 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 and much every week. Otherwise, you're going to make no progress. And she's like, they just want to hire me to do it, you know, for them. So I think there's some validity. And I guess you would call it sort of a, a small group of homeschooled people with teachers. Um, you know, at the moment, that would certainly be valid. 
Now, the problem with that, as and the article mentioned it, is that that further accentuates the digital divide. Not every parent can afford to chip in for that person. Right. And right. so what you have is the disadvantaged kids. I mean, your community, uh, they, they won't have that choice. Um, and if you have some money, you'll have that choice. And now months go by or even semesters or years go by and there's a real divide uh, between the kids who have that benefit and the ones who don't. That troubles me. That That is very troublesome. And like I also, a thought has occurred to me is like, why are we like in a rush? Why shouldn't we be safe? And in the scope of a child's life, say we push back education a little bit in the long run, what difference is it really going to make if you push it back six months or a year and do it correctly? Um, granted, it puts a hardship on parents because they have to work, but if they get their kid home with COVID, they can't go to work anyway. I agree with you 100,000%. That, that's one of those, um, you know, elephant in the room thoughts where we should have thought of that before. You know, and so everybody says, oh, yeah, this will all be, you know, fixed in six months or a year. So we can wait six months or a year. Why expose your kid to the disease? And why have your kid come home and expose you to the disease? And why have the whole school system exposed to the disease? And every parent and everybody associated with every kid exposed to the disease. That's what you get out of the White House these days. That's what you get. That's not thought out. Not a good idea. Your point is really well taken, Gigi. I really appreciate that. But what about the notion of having this is I'm just thinking, you know, because I found in our conversations that I can do this with you. I can have a kind of free, free flow, uh, you know, free association. So wh what about having these kids on on Zoom and having a, a, a teacher join them by Zoom? I mean, it's it's a, it's actually a classroom uh, of Zoom. That's how and, it's going to have to happen right now. Um, yeah. And that's how the distance learning is going to transpire. And there's there's other platforms, there's Zoom or Google Hang, Hangouts, and there's many, many that do the same sort of thing. So the um, teacher plays a double role in the model I'm thinking about. One is the teacher teaches, you know, yeah. and, and she or he can see all the people, all the people in the class right there, like you and I can see on Zoom now in the gallery view. Yeah, right. but, but the teacher does more than teach. The teacher watches. The teacher says, Jimmy, you know, um, why aren't you concentrating? Come on, Jimmy. You're not paying uh, attention, yeah. Yeah, you're not paying attention, and you can see it. Or Jimmy takes a walk, and the teacher says, wait a minute, Jimmy. You know, Perfect. this time is dedicated to our class. Don't take a walk. Now, I mean, I think that would work at a certain age. You're going to be more familiar with the, you know, the concentration capabilities of kids at certain ages. But at a certain age, I think the teacher could handle that, especially if the parent, now who's at work or something, the parent says to Jimmy, you better listen. If you don't listen, I'm going to hear about it. And I'm going to get you. And so you better listen to the teacher. The teacher tells you the teacher is speaking for me as if I were here. So my question is, how young can that go? Um, when, when does that start being meaningful in terms of most kids? Um, I would say third grade and up should be able to do that pretty easily. I think it's a little bit harder with the younger guys, but if you make it fun and engaging, it could even happen with them. There definitely has to be elements of fun in there. Um, it has to be very kid friendly. Um, yeah, I, I think it, it could definitely happen. And the other thing is there, there are, so, there is software. It would be nice to be able to see where they're sitting and they're, their screens of their computer and each individual one so you could really be on them. Um, but you know, the, the schools don't all have that. And then the problem with equity of some people think that you have connectivity, but if they think like, well, if I have it on my phone, I have it at home. Well, that's not necessarily true. So connectivity is a big issue for the low income population. And, you know, and you can't do it all on iPads. You need a, a more sophisticated system than that. Um, some of it you can do, but, you know, so what we found with a school in Waimanala that we work with is, you know, some of the parents thought, well, if they can get it on their phone, that's good enough. You, you can't do learning on a phone for a kid. You know, the uh, Department of Education is not spending a lot of money right now because they're not in operation. Um, I know they have fixed costs and they, they got to take care of the teachers and the teacher union. 
But suppose they took some of that money, spare money, and they bought every kid, including especially disadvantaged kids, um, a serviceable computer. And, you know, buy it in bulk, it's cheaper and all that. And well, I, it, I feel bulk, that's cheaper. I feel like, I think I heard that there was like 114,000 school aged children on Oahu and and 75% of them already have computers. So you're only talking about having to buy computers for 25%, which seems like it should be doable. Yeah. So, I mean, I, there's, there's got to be money for this because we're saving money in other, other areas of education. And, and whether we are or not, there's got to be money for this because this is, you know, if you, if you believe it's important that these kids get educated, uh, then you will buy them a computer and you narrow the, 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 the gap, the, the digital divide. Well, one of the problems too is that it has to be kid friendly and kids sturdy because kids drop them and you have to have a certain amount of replacement and, and they're hard on them. So it's also a matter of teaching them to be respectful of that. Um, and the safeties, there's a lot of safety protocols that need to be drummed into them. Um, and, and probably their parents, you know, you like, mean like creepy things. Yeah. Yeah. Like, what do you say over the internet? What do you say on your computer? Do you give out your name? Safety first, you know, um, what's appropriate to do and not do. Yeah. A lot of parents could use that training too. Yeah, they could. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. <clears throat> so if I gave you a, <clears throat> a group of kids who was, um, you know, virtual on Zoom, <clears throat> assume they have, <clears throat> excuse me, they have, they have computers and computers haven't been broken yet. What would you teach them? Would you give them a whole curriculum? Would you try to, you know, you know, duplicate the curriculum in the schools? Or would you focus on certain things instead? And if I gave you these kids for, I don't know, it wouldn't be a whole school day, say four hours a day, four hours a day. What would you focus on? Well, my focus is on, and I think it's very important to, to teach them to become solid computer users where they use the computer as a tool to enhance their productivity and creativity and efficiency. That would definitely be in there. It wouldn't have to be in, in there every day. Once a week would be probably good enough to do that. Um, I would definitely be, you know, you, they have to do math, they have to do science, they have to do reading. Um, but, you know, that's, my, that's not my forte, so I can't speak to how many hours you would do of each of those a day, um, but they would definitely have to be in there. You'd be one, one course among many, yeah? Somebody else would be developing a, what do you want to yeah. call it, a substantive uh, content. Exactly, like the school teacher could teach what they're supposed to be teaching, you know, mm -hmm. a couple hours a day and have certain projects that they have to do, that the kids have to do. And the ones that I think are working really hard are the school teachers because they've been forced to create things online and to do things differently. And they're maybe not very prepared to do that to begin with, but they're just kind of having to put in the extra effort to, to see if it works. And then they're also having to create paper versions of the same thing for those that don't have computers at home. Oh, what a waste. That's, that, is, that is a duplication yeah. of effort. Yeah. What about, uh, what about you teaching those, uh, those uh, teachers? Don't they need to be taught? Because some of them are going to, some of them, I don't want to tell you everything you don't know, but some of them are going to resist the whole thing. Uh, they definitely are. And we've actually... We're in the process, we're almost done creating a guide for teachers for distant learning, distance learning, which we're actually just going to give them because um, we think that that's the right thing to do. And because they don't know the, the right acronyms, there's different LMS, learning management systems, there are different chat, chat things, there's different kinds of system, and nobody's given them the, the scope of what the variety is or the comparison. And they need that to make good decisions. They also should be drumming in the safety issues with the kids. And I'm not sure that's happening either. You know, so well, maybe maybe that's for somebody like you. I mean, assuming you have the time and resources to do it, I would see that the computer savvy education, including you know keeping kids safe safe online, um, would come from one source, and then the substance yeah. would come from the the regular teachers. But the regular teachers have to be up on this. And they have to understand how to engage. Um, and, and, and a lot of them can't do that. They've got to be taught to do that. Furthermore, software. I wanted to talk to you about software. So right now you said you're, you know, you're trying to teach them uh, 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 what Microsoft Office. 
Microsoft <laughs> Office. Um, Office 365 is free to schools. Schools um, are most, they're, they're using a lot of Google Docs, which Google Docs is okay, but I feel like the kids are getting sh uh, shortchanged. It's not um, as entailed or it's not as sophisticated as Microsoft Office, which is pretty much everywhere in the workplace and once you get out of school. Um, but hopefully they can gain those skills and transition to it without too much trouble because they, they're growing up with technology, so they're not adverse to, to learning it or picking it up. They pick it up quickly. Yeah, well, I, I totally agree with you. Microsoft is uh, A, more powerful, and B, um, although you know, some people don't like it, but B, um, Microsoft is in the workplace. It's ubiquitous and it's going to stay there. Yep. Um, and so if, if Microsoft is giving it away free, what they're doing is they're, they're, they're connecting with all these kids who are going to know something about it. And that sets the standard for the workplace, whether the workplace be in an office or it be at home, that's, that's a whole other conversation. But this I think that part of, part of this is to train them to work at home when they get to working age. The problem I think with the schools is that they jump on the cheapest thing right away without doing the right research. So they invest in Chromebooks because they were like $200, but the Chromebooks can't do a lot of things. Now, there, I understand there's new versions of Chromebooks coming out that will be able to run Windows, but so they, are, they have a lot of these things, you know, not, not top quality products, but they, it, it comes down to money basically. That's too bad, you can't go. <clears throat> you can't go short on money when you're talking about the next generation. Lord knows this country has failed to educate several generations already. And, and you can see that in, in the political times in which we live. When 20%, did you see this yesterday? 20% of the people polled on a national basis did not know who Kamala Harris was, did not know who she was. And I say, yeah. you know, what, what kind of ignorance is that? It's pervasive, um, yeah. which, which drives me to another question I want to ask you. It's OK. Yeah. So you have, you have Microsoft, and presumably you have the Microsoft browser, the uh, what's, what's the name of that browser again? Uh, uh, the, the build Explorer or the Edge. Yeah, Explorer or Edge. I like Explorer myself. Um, and, and that's really where you learn a lot of stuff on the browser. Mm -hmm. I spend a good part of my, my thinking day on the browser because I can see everything I want to see in the world on that browser. It's my main, my, it's my portal to knowledge of all kinds. So are you teaching them about that? Yes, we definitely teach them about that. We teach them the importance of doing um, searches, how to do searches, how to decipher what may be good or bad information, um, and and about copywriting and, and using the right protocol. Um, so they can't just plagiarize things because that's easy to do too. <laughs> <laughs> well, these days, that's yeah. ubiquitous too. Yeah. So, okay, that, to me, that is really, really important. Okay, and the next, the next thing, and, I, uh, and maybe this isn't your wheelhouse, but um, there is a lot of software. And I remember going to classes at the university back when, when I was studying this myself, uh, in the outreach college there, a lot of software that is dedicated to teaching you stuff. And it's software that's built to teach you a course. And you go through a certain amount of, you know, learning and then you take a test and then you yep. go to another chapter and all that. Now, I, don't, I don't know, it probably evolved a lot since then. And it's probably including a lot of video now that it, you know, it wasn't mm -hmm. including then. Um, mm -hmm. But building that software is, is critical for this, isn't it? What do you do about that? Well, I think you have to research what's out there. I think there's a lot out there. There's a lot of good kid stuff out there and there, some of it is even older that, that is really good. There's a lot of series called the Edmark series for K to two kids that focuses on gaming kind of things that's teaching math or reading or rhyming or things like that. Um, and I think that the educators aren't used to looking for that kind of stuff because they're kind of still mostly teaching in traditional ways in the classroom. So I'm hoping that this COVID stuff will force the issue of education to change and become more um, proactive in seeking alternatives. Yeah, it sounds like it actually will because COVID's not going away. And I think parents in Hawaii care a lot about their kids and they're, gonna, they're not going to be so quick to 
turn him back into the uh, into into a viral school. Um, and so, um, what you're doing is really central to that. It, it starts with teaching him about you know the basic rules of operating a computer and and a browser, but it goes much further because what what you're doing is actually helping to shape uh, the educational paradigm which is being invented all around us now the, right. the the national discussion on this has got to result in a new paradigm about how you teach young kids you're you're definitely involved i hope so and i hope um I, i'm i'm sure when we get done with our curriculum migration it's going to be awesome and then it's a matter of marketing and, and getting it in the schools. And right now I feel like I can't even try to market it because they're so uh, concerned about how they're gonna go to school and, and for COVID. So it's kind of like a catch 22 because they should have it right now and they need all this computer stuff, but they're really focused on the child safety and the COVID stuff. So I'm, I'm giving it like a little rest and for a few months, I'm gonna do a, a mail out to them and we'll see what happens on that. But you know, I can't, I can't even go call and meet with a school right now. So, you know. Um, I think I think uh, the DOE has to be reorganized here around this, not not just because of COVID, but because of the future. So what, where do you put all of this on a priority list? If, if somebody from the legislature called you up one day, Gigi, and said, where is all this fit? How high on the, the priority poll should this be in terms of our public policy, in terms of making the state um you know magnetic that is it'll it'll hold kids they won't they won't wind up being discouraged and leaving town or what have you or or going into a, a life that rejects knowledge that's the worst thing of all um, well, it, where is it on the priority list in my mind i think the use the proper use of technology should be right up there with reading and writing and math because in today's world you can't do anything without a computer um, it's always been kind of traditionally seen as an add on thing, but I think it's become a necessity and early on in our years, my board president said to me if if we've done a good job, we should go away in 10 years and I would make the argument that it's more necessary today than ever and that it ever has been. Yeah, it's not going to go away. That's for no, sure. Never, ever. Go away. You know, so when people talk about reimagining the economy because right now we have no economy. We have nothing. But yeah. Uh, so, uh, and reimagining the economy, you know, what always comes to mind is uh, the possibility of becoming a more tech state and having entrepreneurs and innovators who develop tech things and, and sell them and, and have good, good in income and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, do you think there's a way uh, to shape or reshape our educational system to actually do that? Because we've been trying since John Burns to have a tech state and we you can look around you don't see that yet is it still possible and what what do you, what do you do what do you think people could do to get there well i think it's a good you know everybody talks about diversifying our economy i think it's certainly a good way of, of doing that and that it's desperately needed um i know that for a while they had the manoa innovation center but uh, you know, I think they could do it on more of a, a level with with teaching program, make, making software for kids. They could do it on all kinds of levels. Um, but I think that was a different, like that was a higher scale project, I think, there. Yeah. But, well, JG, what, what, uh, what, uh, what would you leave with our audience? We're almost out of time here. What would you leave with our audience in terms of a message, a message about... Uh, Ohana computer with a K, a message about kids and education and the need for computers and software to keep them engaged and thinking and train them and give them the tools of knowledge. What would you say about um, people who want to support you? Where should they look to find out more about you? Where should they look to find out where to send their checks, their checks, you know what I mean, their checks? Uh, to give them a message you want to leave them with. Okay. Well, I feel like they can always look at our website, www.ohanacomputerwithak.org. Um, there's a donation um, button there. Um, checks can be mailed to us. There are, our address is on there. I feel like th these COVID times should be, are opening new frontiers for us. And that's kind of exciting to change the face of education. Now, whether, whether our local crew jumps on board it in that manner, or they're just putting out fires and Band-Aid approaches, 
I hope they'll take a longer term view and do some good planning. And any schools or people that want to learn more about how we can help them, we like to be seen as a resource to the community. And we've, we've been doing this for 20 years. So we know what we're doing and we know how kids learn and they can pick it up. And we have an awesome curriculum and the online version will be available soon. And that will be even more awesome. So and, <clears throat> and about the underprivileged families and the seniors who who really don't have access to these tools, what do you say to them? Well, um, we've been teaching seniors and adults, and we've actually been teaching them in small groups of four or less on Zoom. Um, we try and write grants for funding. It's, of course, a tough time. Um, and if we have a paid class, I'm, I'm always willing to fit someone in that can't pay um, as, I, as that's part of our, our um, mission to serve the economically disadvantaged. So we try our best. Um, you know, we're not a big household name. So um, we get funding throughout, you know, we've gotten funding throughout the years, obviously, but we, like instead of giving us 10 or 20,000, they give us three or five. I'd, I'd like to go for bigger bucks. Last question, Gigi. You, you said you've been doing it for 20 years and, and I have known you for oh, a fraction of that, but not an insubstantial fraction. So the question is, why do you do this? This is a, a nonprofit. I don't think you're going to get to be a, a billionaire doing this, but uh, why do you do it? You're consistently doing it year after year. Why? Well, um, I was always... When I was a kid, I wanted to go into education and I was kind of pushed into business, which I'm glad I have that background and I have a very strong financial business background. And um, so I feel like I'm doing kind of the, most, the best of both worlds. I'm kind of an admin person in education using my business sense and making a difference in people's lives. And I think, I guess, I guess I'm one of those do-gooders. I like to, I like to help people's lives and um, yeah, I don't get paid a, a huge salary, but I survive, so it's okay. Yeah, this is this is the time when it really shines. Thank you so much, Gigi. Thank you for all of that. Gigi Davidson, Ohana Computer, the larger Ohana Computer. Thank you so much. And they could also call our phone number, which is 523-8191, if they want any information. Good. I knew you'd say that. <laughs> Thank you for, Thank you. for interviewing me again. Uh, we'll do it again. Don't leave town. <laughs> I'm not going anywhere. One, can, one can't even go anywhere if one wants to. <laughs> Thank you, Gigi. Aloha.